Hello, everybody. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. I am super excited because tonight we have Halloween may have happened, but spookiness has not ended for us. And I am very excited because we have Ariel Winter with us, and he's going to be in conversation with Isaac Marion. And we are celebrating Ariel's new book, The Preserve, which is, okay, I'm not going to give too much away, but it's such a cool combination of a bunch of different things. But think humanity is the minority. You have really smart robots that essentially are ruling the world. And then there's preserves in which they're going to let humanity attempt to exist without robot interference. And then someone gets murdered. And then what happens? I mean, you have to read the book to find that part out. But I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Isaac and let them talk to you about this awesome, amazing book. And thank you so much for joining us. Um, but right before I pass it off, this is the Vanna White section, as I like to call it. If you have any questions, right down below, you will see a little thing that says, ask a question. If you have a question for our authors, please make sure to ask it there. Don't ask it in the general chat. Make sure you ask it in that section. And also, the best way to celebrate a new book, and this is a new book. It literally came out yesterday. The best way to best celebrate way. a new book is to purchase it. I am a bookseller, I am biased, but you know what? I think it's the best way to celebrate a new book. And if you would like a signed book plate, we actually have signed book plates for the preserve, which is very exciting. So enough rambling on my end. Isaac, take it away, and I will see you guys at the end of the event. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, this is a fun uh, way to get away from the rest of the world. I thought I'm glad there's some other people who feel the same. Uh, this kind of feels like a reunion of sorts. Um, Ariel and I are sort of, I guess we're on the same publisher. We hung out in Baltimore once. And I also um, w was at Mysterious Galaxy uh, a while ago on this crazy van tour thing that I did. And um, so it feels like kind of I'm among friends here and congratulations, Ariel, big, big day. Thank you. Thank you. It is. I should preface real quick. Um, I am in a re remote cabin on a remote Washington Island and my internet is a big rusty satellite dish out in the yard. It's incredibly bad internet. So I have usually have a really bad delay. If you can even see my face, it's probably just a lot of pixel blocks. But um, the sound is the important thing, right? Because we're here to, to discuss. But just I'm going to like leave a lot of dead air um, after I speak and before I speak on you, because otherwise we'll be interrupting each other constantly. So just assume I'm calling like from from Germany or something. And that's about how it will be. So um, I I don't know. I, I wonder, I'm assuming that most people in here are are familiar with with your books are our fans but there may be a few people that i roped in as well so i thought maybe you know i'll give a a, a quick introduction on top of um the previous introduction uh i so i i can't i found out about you through well actually through our mutual publisher because she sent me um the baron cove um just because she thought i might be interested turns out i was it was actually the first First um, of many, of, of the many submissions that they sent me to potentially give a blurb on, it was literally the first one that I actually liked. So congratulations on that. And uh, I was happy to, to praise that one. But, um, and then I just, you know, I read the, the, the one we're here to discuss very recently, but um, I, I did not read your debut yet. Um, the the tw 20 year death? Yes. That's 20 years, right? Yes. Yeah. And but but I'm familiar with it and I've, I've read up about it. And uh, I was just kind of curious um, because fr from from what I from the sounds of it, it that book is, is a fairly grounded, you know, traditional detective kind of story of, of real life. And uh, I was wondering if there was any hint in that one um, that you were going to be going off onto this more kind of fantastical direction or was that was that a surprise to you as well? So, so the secret is that I wrote Baron Cove, the first draft of Baron Cove, before I wrote the 20-year death. 
Uh, so the, okay. the switch for me went the other way. So I wrote that Baron Cove, for people who don't know, is another science fiction book dealing in a world where robots are the dominant species on the planet uh, and humans are in a distinct minority. Um, I wrote that before writing the 20 year death. Um, so the, the change to sort of a more realistic setting went the other way for me, even though for readers, uh, it went from a realistic setting to, to a more fantastical setting. Okay. So, so you, you dipped your toes in, in realism. They're like, I'm getting, I'm getting out of here <laughs> <laughs> back into, into, you know, well, it's all realistic to, to a point. It's just the, the, the one twist of the setting that, that takes it into, to me, much more interesting territory. Cause I just, I'm a, I'm a, that's kind of my, my ideal genre. If you can call it a genre is like realism with, with some kind of twist. I like things to be you know, based in reality and based in human psychology and, and like relatable human themes, but to have like just a little something askew that allows me to kind of like access it from a different angle or something. And this is right in line with, with that. But, um, I was curious, uh, so I, I, as I was kind of refreshing myself and I read Baron Cove many years ago and um you know still it's it left a, a, a vivid imprint but i wanted but there are elements of it and just in case they come up i wanted to refresh myself and i, I re was reading the synopsis of it i noticed the synopsis is com completely um at least assuming what i see on goodreads is the is the real synopsis there's not a mention of robots anywhere in it it, it appears to be just a, a very normal uh family saga kind of tale based on that description and i was wondering was that intentional to kind of like bury the lead and surprise people with that element of it like was that something you discussed with your your team so that was the publisher's decision um i actually thought it was burying the lead um and lobbied for getting the word robots in there much earlier okay. um but they <laughs> They wanted it to be more of a, a reveal. Um, they were positioning it sort of more as literary fiction than even though it ha had a science fiction element, um, yeah. they were positioning it as literary fiction. And so um, I think they they wanted the sort of surprise of the robots. Um, even though I felt like uh, they should sort of focus on the robots. <laughs> That, that's so funny to me because it, it's uh, you know, the fact that you have to like completely hide the actual premise in order to be accepted as literary, even though it is it is literary fiction. Everything about the style of it is is in the literary style. But just the fact that there are robots in it means you have to completely, you know, play this this game of keep away with the potential <laughs> reader. Yeah, as I recall, the actual book, it's not. Is it? It's not really a reveal in the book, is it? Isn't it fairly evident from the beginning that, that yes. there, this is a world with robots in it? Yes. No. It's it's yeah. there in the first it's, page. It's, it's funny because the, the same situation happened with me, um, and not in the the synopsis itself, but my agent when he was p pitching the book to publishers, um, he basically did that same whole tactic where he described the whole story as you know in very normal. Uh, mundane terms and then you know after he had completely put it all out there and he's like oh and the main character is a zombie <laughs> like, kind of like, have to get the butter people up to get them to even listen to you once you involve these these genre elements which is unfortunate and of great frustration to both of us i'm sure yeah um but yeah so i on kind of that related note, I'm, I'm curious what, um, well, for one thing it is, I didn't get the, the sense that this was meant to be a sequel or anything, but is it in your mind in any way, are they, is it in the same universe as Baron Cove or is it just a, a variation on a theme? So in my mind, they, they do sort of take place in the same world. Um, okay. They definitely informed one another in Baron Cove. 
all the characters, but really but one, um, are robots. Um, and so I sort of wanted to flip that in the same, if it was the same setting, but in which everybody were was a human, uh, and really there's only one main character who is a robot. Um, so they do take place in sort of the same universe, but I wanted to uh, sort of explore it in sort of negative uh, of each, you know, of, of each other. Okay. So, okay, that makes sense. So, so I, I wish, you know, I had time to reread that one again, just to see how the parallels line up. But as I was reading um, the preserve, I was thinking like, I feel like Baron Cove had a, there was something different about the setting as far as like, was it, is it a different time period or something? Felt like it wasn't quite in the same sociological situation. I think that, um, but, I think that Baron Cove, it, you know, they don't line up exactly. Um, I think mm -hmm. that Baron Cove in some ways is, is further along in the timeline. Um, but the, yeah. the, the, some of that is the setting though. Um, you know, in Baron Cove, they're in a sort of remote location um, where the preserve, while sparsely populated, is more populated. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess you know, that makes sense. Uh, I had and I had that sense in reading it in that that um, Baron Cove feels like it, it it takes place earlier somehow and just in the sense that there's more conflict that it feels like the the human robot um tensions are more extreme whereas baron cove it feels almost like like uh it's it the, the war is long over and robots are just the dominant species um completely and 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 but i guess that's just the you know, like the rural the rural uh, aristocratic setting kind of where <laughs> The uh, old money robots are, you know, not troubled by the concerns of the the, the preserve. <laughs> yeah, it's it's regional. I think you know the it it doesn't play out the same in everywhere. You know, um, and so it is yeah. sort of regional, which is mentioned in the preserve. I mean, the the preserve that we focus on uh, is um, in uh, is centered around Charleston. Um, but it mentions preserves sort of out west, and that they have a very different population. Um, okay. So, 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 so there are regional aspects to it. It's interesting now that I think of it in, in as being, you know, different takes on the same on the same world. Um, from it sounds like this is kind of something that you like to do uh, with um, twenty year death. It was there. They're you know three three stories kind of in different in different styles right or different yeah. similar genre but but kind of different takes on it and this is almost oh, feels like a similar like experiment where you have Baron Cove is like the the more kind of refined literary style and then this is like a little more gritty and uh, kind of hard boiled vibe and but they're you know still in the same same subject matter. Yeah, so similar to what you were saying about um, what excites you about fiction, um, I I love genre, and I like playing in lots of different genres, and I like doing genre bending and sort of mixing of genres. So, um, you know, the preserve is definitely a police procedural. You know, it's it's a it's a mystery, murder mystery, which is one of my other passions. Obviously, the twenty year death is. Um, is, is mystery, um, but I mix it in with the science fiction uh, element, and it I think makes it exciting and different. Yeah, it, it, it's for me that there was kind of two mysteries in it for for me. Um, uh, like the actual plot mystery is interesting on one level, but I actually found I was more intrigued by the the kind of the greater mystery behind it all of just like what what is this world and it kind of just plunge into it like there's no exp there's there's very little exposition as far as um you know the war began in 2022 or whatever and like a kind of big 
grand thing. It's like everyone involved, including, as far as I recall, the the narration, it's it like assumes that you already know what's going on and what the different factors are and and kind of the world that is that it's in. And and I kind of like I I loved it and 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 grappled with it at the same time because I'm like I I feel like I want to know more about it, but that's kind of and I'm like almost frustrated, but but that's it makes me want to read more because because you're like leaving these breadcrumbs little by little you start to get a little glimpse of what the context is for things and it's like it feels more and more satisfying as that's revealed which i assume was was kind of the idea because it's yeah it's, and it works and I, have to, I have to say based on on sort of some of the reviews i've read of the reserve people have mixed feelings about that some people uh, other people have commented on the fact that um the world is not explained um, and some people wish that it was more explained, but it was intentional. Um, I feel strongly, um, and I, I've done this, I think, in in all of my books, that the characters know the world that they're in, um, that they don't need it explained. Um, and so as long as they behave and react to that world uh, in a realistic way, the reader ends up sort of beginning to understand what that world is, um, which is sort of the experience it sounds like you had. Yeah, I think that that if, if it's handled deftly, that's the best way to to do world building is is the, the, the less, you know, information dumps that are required, I think the better not just not, not because it's slow, like, I'm not I'm not really a big um, anti slow i'm the anti-exposition person and that like anytime there's someone explaining something i don't immediately get bored I, I find it interesting but it i think if it's possible to do it you know live in the scene as opposed to pausing the story to explain it it, it it's there's kind of an exhilarate an exhilaration in being disoriented when you're kind of in a world where you don't know what's going on but you you understand that that's the intention and you're going to find out what you need, what you need to, as you go, there's something kind of like, you know, the dialogue's just coming at you and you don't, you don't really know what, what some of the context is or what some of the references mean, but it's like, it's like, you've just been dropped into a situation and like, Oh, where am I? What's happening? This is, it's, it's like uncomfortable and exciting at the same time. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad that you felt that way. I, I think that, you know, I definitely find that exciting as well um you know you, it, like you said it sort of becomes a puzzle and you sort of have to figure it out as you go. i mean i i don't i don't know if you have any intention of continuing in this vein but i i felt like um you know it was clear that you were focusing it was kind of a narrow focus story you know there, there's this sprawling you know massively changed world that the characters inhabit where you know some something incredibly dramatic has happened to where the whole shift not only the creation of sentient ai but the the total dominance of it presumably there's been massive shifts in in the world to get to this point but it's like it's so zero focus that you you only can kind of get an echo and a, a sense of that world beyond and it's like i accepted that but i was also like i want to know so much more about everything like i'd, I'd read more books to just like explore this this reality because you know that reality i've seen it in like really sci-fi sci-fi like you know far future sci-fi where it's it's much more um you know out there but it's not really something that i've i've seen in in like a, a grounded way and and I'm sure there's there's stuff out there, but I'm not. I haven't come across anything to like really explore the idea of a of a AI dominant society that that is you know Earth as we know it, but where this has happened. I think it's a really interesting idea that doesn't really get explored that much. Like they're usually the story would usually come in like during at the at the beginning of the war or whatever the the ai takeover or something it's it's not often you get to plunge in like long after it's been settled and it's kind of like we've moved on to different conflicts that's just i i could i could eat that up yeah i but, you know that that's also i i agree um you know the 
the robot war has been done a lot. You know, obviously Terminator is the, the sort of big one, um, but uh, you know, a lot of a lot of people have done the human robot war. Um, that's why in the preserve, um, it's clear that there's been a series of pandemics that have wiped out a lot of humanity. Um, so the robots ended up in the majority sort of by accident. And now there is conflict, um, but it's not universal conflict. Um, there are plenty of robots that don't feel, feel any uh, sort of animosity towards humanity. Um, they're factions. Um, but the robots sort of found themselves in, in control uh, almost by accident. Um, and I think that that's a very different take on sort of the robot takeover. Um, and I, I hope that that is what makes it a very, I mean, I think that's part of what makes it the world you're describing where it's, it's a um, more grounded, realistic sort of approach to it. Um, since it doesn't have to be quite as uh, dire <laughs> as having like the Terminator War. No, that's true. Yeah, I I, I recall now that 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 situation. I, that I feel like that wasn't it was almost a spoiler. <laughs> that was part of the the mystery that is revealed as the the story unfolds. But it doesn't really, you know, you you, you get hints of it from the beginning beginning but but that is you know a scenario that seems you know the most plausible if there ever were to be a robot society it seems much more likely that it would be through some kind of accident i i've always been like i love the idea of an apocalypse that just happens not because of like some huge catastrophic event but just like some somebody fucked up and like some, you know the virus is released or just just things were managed badly and humanity just kind of dwindles <laughs> yeah it, it is definitely more like AI is being evil that's a great twist um, right, yeah i wonder so hearing you confirm that this is sort of an unofficial sequel or perhaps prequel to um to baron cove um is it I'm interested in like what what interests you about this idea of of kind of the robotic uh, inversion of of humanity and, and robots robots sort of becoming humanity. Um, clearly, it's something that fascinates you. If you've written, if you've gone gone to that well twice. Um, is there? I guess first of all, I'm curious if if you think you you have other places to go in that theme or but also like what it is that, that draws you to that theme. So to answer the first part of your question, um, what draws me to it is the fact that the AIs can be immortal um, because they can always replace parts and be updated and sort of um, are, can live forever, um, but they have a lot of the same uh, sort of existential feelings of a human. And so I think that, um, you know, the sort of humanity's advantage in not being immortal is making life precious and the importance of what you do in your life, where the AIs have this sort of existential question of what is my purpose if it just goes on forever? and uh, some of the AIs choose to shut down. Um, they, they die by choice. Um, and so that, that sort of tension between uh, sort of an immortal species and the, you know, the human mortal species is what excites me the most. Yeah, that's a fascinating idea. It almost it's almost like like ancient mythology, like the gods, you know, like these this this tiers of mortals and and immortals and how they basically, you know, have so much power, but it 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 comes with all these existential questions. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so that's what interests me. And I definitely think that that, that is sort of 
gives endless possibilities. So um, the book I'm working on now is not a robot book, but I'm not saying that I won't some someday come back to um, a robot book. I mean, the, the the part of the world that we haven't seen is sort of an urban environment. Um, you know, Baron Cove is in sort of a remote setting and the preserve is um, also sort of, like I said, sparsely populated. Um, so I am interested in seeing what the robot city looks like. Yeah, that would be interesting. I have a, a question on that note that's kind of like more of just a, um, a fan curiosity question. And it, it's not, you know, it's not part of um, the books unless there may have been a me mentions of this in Baron Cove. I've read it many years ago. But um, something I've always thought about is like in, in that scenario, if there were, you know, a, a, a species of AI, even if they aren't dominant on the planet, but especially if they are, um, what in your mind, like, I understand on one level that you need it to take place in reality or else it's a whole different kind of story. But is there, do you have at least your own personal theory as to why they would choose to live in mechanical bodies as opposed to just being virtual? Yeah, so that, I mean that's definitely a good question. One thing that they do is they start to modify their bodies. Um, they're, they uh, don't. So a lot of the AIs look like humans, um, and that's sort of how they were initially built. Um, and so most of them appear like humans. But um, as time has gone on, th they start to modify their bodies, and uh, we have you know, AIs that are much larger and stronger than humans, um, sort of military AIs. And we have AIs that are sort of like punk AIs where they've switched out their legs for wheels and things like that. Um, I think that the sort of individual aspect of it um, is sort of because they have personalities. Um, so I think that there's still, um, there's still that that sense of identity um, is still attached to sort of the physical form. So it's kind of a, a philosophical choice. Like, yeah, they, it is. Um, they don't want to. Yeah. Yeah, I think Sorry. I think it is um, the, you know, one thing that Baron Cove do, talks about, and there's a little bit of this in the preserve also is sort of their ability to communicate without talking out loud. Um, at, and their ability to sort of transfer information uh, to one another, um, which definitely is very different than human, humans are. Um, and, uh, you know, the sort of, there's sort of almost a social, when you're around humans, it's like not, not the thing to do. You should, you should talk out loud is the more socially right. uh, acceptable sort of thing. Um, so, uh, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> well, you, yeah, kind of, it, it sounds like the robots in this world are kind of like, they're, they're, they're right on the edge. They're toying with the boundary between objective reality and, and virtual reality. They, they have bodies, but they modify them wildly and, and freely and they communicate kind of virtually, but there's just some, some, some element some that compels them to, um, to maintain some kind of physical presence as opposed to just being, you know, disembodied AIs in a virtual space, which is an interesting question. And like, obviously, you know, if you were to go to the virtual space, it would be just a completely different kind of story. And so like, yeah. I understand the the restraints, but it's something that you know, I, I've, there's a story that I've tinkered with over the years that I of kind of a similar type of world where basically every, everyone's mechanical and, and, and the main character was the one human. And I went back and forth with someone for with a while. Cause like, he just couldn't accept that this sort of future would, could exist while with people still being in, in reality. He was like, if they, if they have the technology to, you know, transfer consciousness into a mechanical body, why wouldn't they just put it on the internet and everybody lives in World of Warcraft, basically? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, well, there's probably reasons, but that that really takes some some exploration. 
So, um, so there's a conversation, I guess this, like you said, spoilers, but there's a conversation late in the preserve um, where, uh, so the, the main character is a human uh, detective, the chief of police on one of the smaller towns on the preserve. Um, and he, his, from before the preserves, he was a police officer and his partner was a robot. Um, and the, his robot partner comes to the preserve uh, to help with the investigation of this murder. And they have a conversation um, late in the book in which the robot talks about the fact that the robots have found themselves to be sort of both the, um, col the colonized society and also the dominant society. And so I sort of explore the way that um, when the when colonies are, um, you know, uh, granted their independence, that they often sometimes uh, still take on sort of the the uh, structure of the that was put on them by the sort of uh, imperial power. And so some of that is what's going on is that the uh, humans have sort of left abruptly um, and the robots sort of don't know yet how to exist in a world that doesn't look like the world that they were in. So they talk, you know, they're still sort of operating a government similar to our government and sort of a military similar to our military. And, um, and I, so I think some of that is that they, um, you know, they don't know how to, or they haven't yet figured out what it means to be a robot, not in the image of a human. Yeah, yeah. right. No, that, that actually makes sense. That, that scene was, I felt like was one of the most poignant moments in the, in the book. Like they're, they're, they're the way that the story is like, you know, fairly, fairly gritty and, and, and like, you know, hard, hard boiled for, for the most part, which I feel like makes it those little moments of um, kind of philosophical eruptions or emotional vulnerability moments stand out all the more because, because of their, their rarity and their, they kind of catch you off guard. And if, if you're referring to the moment, I, I think you are where they're on the boat and he's talking about this, I thought that was, um, it, it kind of shows the the uh, the vulnerability of the the robots as well, and that they're they're sort of you for most of the story and kind of in Baron Cove as well. You get this feeling that they're kind of like, you know, they're they're more more powerful than humans, and they've you know sort of corralled us and like they're they're. It's easy to to think of them as like you know the bullies, but then you get these little moments that are like, oh, they're kind of like they're struggling in their own unique ways and like unexpected ways and. I thought that was, you know, not only does it kind of answer my question about, you know, why they haven't thrown off the shackles of of molecules and and you know created their own universe inside a computer, uh, it makes sense that you know maybe they they get there in a hundred years from now when they finally like break shake off the internalized humanity and, and just fully embrace what they are. But yeah, they're kind of like stuck in between, which is great. Yeah. Um. Well, that that's about the end of the questions that I had lined up. Um, sure, it looks it was, like we have. Some you know, questions. I kind of forgot. <laughs> yeah, I forgot that we had an audience. I'm just like talking to you because I have I'm, my own questions of interest. <laughs> 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 when you started describing the the scenario of the story, I I suddenly remembered. Oh yeah, there are people listening here who haven't read the book yet. <laughs> so good on you for staying professional. <laughs> yeah, it looks like we have some questions um, in the. Uh, chat below um, so we can see that and and maybe people ask like uh, what's this book about so we can we can go back and circle back and explain that better cool shall we yeah yeah go ahead um let's see was our moderator gonna be involved in this or some some uh no, I think that you should just curating or were we just dive in?
Yeah, just dive okay. in and the uh, Well it's just uh, uh, one of them has an upvote, so we'll go with that one first. <laughs> what was the hardest part of this book to write and which part brought you the most joy? Um, I think I think the most joy question is maybe easier, so I'll start with that. Um, the so at the heart of the book is the sort of family uh, that the you know the main character's family, like the sense is that that's what is motivating him and and his wife. You know his their child is sort of central, and so I think that. Um, sort of having that family unit be um, in, an integral part of the book is what gives me that I, I'm proud of that. Um, so I think that that gives me a lot of joy. Um, the difficult part of writing the book, well, I mean, from a from a technical standpoint, pacing is always the you know one of the more challenging aspects, especially when you're writing a mystery. Um, the book is you know, changed dramatically over the course of writing it. Uh, so there are whole scenes, of course, that were in earlier versions of the book. And, and some of that is just figuring out the pacing and getting the, the storytelling right. Agreed. Relatable <laughs> challenges. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's some, there's some in here that are kind of specific questions about the plot. And I think I'll, I'll let you decide whether you want to answer those because they sure. could possibly be, be, be too much, but um, I'll do the ones that are not that first. So when, how do you think robots make the transition from being machines that recognize complex patterns and make a choice based off learning patterns to having more arbitrary preferences like humans do? I've got kind of a, uh, mechanical philosophy question here, which is right, right. So that's called the singularity. Is is when he, when robots or when computers become sentient, um, is referred to as the singularity, um, and uh, sort of what is going to precipitate that. I, I don't know that I know any better um, than anybody else. Um, there's a there's a story that's told that I think is apocryphal uh, that of a computer, um, I think that the story goes that it's at MIT or, or someplace like that. Um, it has the, that it gets shut off at night uh, and that one morning when it's turned back on, it sort of, it asks, where did it go? You know, where, where was it? And, and it sort of explained that it gets shut off and it says that it doesn't like that, that it doesn't like being shut off. Um, and that that is sort of the first, uh, first moment uh, that a computer sort of switches from being just a program to being, to having sort of preferences or, you know, sentience. Um, when I heard that story, it was told as though it had really happened. Uh, I, I, I doubt that that has happened and we haven't heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little like a, a creepy pasta in the, in the making. Yeah. Uh, like internet yeah. urban legends. Yeah. Or maybe, and I could buy that, that it said that, but it's, it's so hard to tell with, with AI because there's so, so many, so much of AI is intentionally designed, you know, to, to mimic something that humans might do or say, but it, it's, it's, you know, it's like a clockwork, automatron you know it's that right. moves around like a to, to imitate human motion but it's not you know choosing anything it's just that's what the gears do right. and of course you can get pretty deep into the philosophy of it isn't it of you know are we the same is we're we just a collection of of uh what did you what, what the question say recognizing complex patterns making a choice based off learning patterns that's pretty much us as well but i think it's a different huge difference of complexity if you have you know a card counting computer where it's just on off or something to, to do a simple math program that can't really even approximate choice. But I think, you know, if you escalate the complexity of those, um, those pattern recognitions to such an insane degree, it start the line just kind of gradually blurs. I mean, right. in my, in my opinion, there's not going to be 
a single moment or a single line. It's just going to be like, it's going to get more and more ambiguous until you can't really tell anymore. And right. it's just like, I don't know, this feels like a person and, and who are we to say anymore? <laughs> so. Yeah, no, I mean, I think most people are familiar with the Turing test, you know, which is um, where a computer uh, has a conversation with a human um, in, and the human doesn't realize that it's conversing with a computer. Um, you know, this can be done through like an AI chat. Um, if the chat has reached a level where you think you're chatting with a person, um, then it's said to sort of pass the Turing test. Um, and I think that, uh, I think things like, you know, customer service AI chats are, are hoping to, to sort of reach that point. Um, but they would still just be answering based on a complex set of, you know, predetermined question and answers. Right. Yeah, it's like, you know, like those old text based video games from from back in my childhood where where, you know, you would type in what you wanted your character to do and then it would it would respond based on like your actual verbiage. Right. But there were moments where it was really shocking and almost creepy, like, oh, my God, it really understood that when I thought I was just, you know, messing with it and I would say <laughs> something out of left field and it would have like a, a response loaded for that. There's a moment of like this is way more intelligent, but it, it I think in reality it's just it has some kind of algorithm for for like parsing the words that I put in and like connecting it to one of you know five different things that some human wrote for it to say, right? And that's where it gets you know if it's just selecting from like a playlist of human responses rather than generating its own logic and everything. And I don't know, this <laughs> is possibly beyond the scope of of uh of our our job with this book <laughs> yeah like, well, the but it's an interesting also, question so yeah and sort of going back to like where are we in in relation to that moment one of the sort of scariest things that i've seen and you can search for it on youtube um there there was a in in order to do computer learning there was a group that was loading old Atari video games into a computer. And the only thing they were giving the computer in terms of being able to recognize the game was that it could map what, uh, what, what appeared on the screen. Um, and there's a video of the computer learning how to play Breakout, which is the, the game where uh, you're controlling a paddle at the bottom of the screen and there's a ball and it's hitting up, you're, you're hitting the ball up into a, a group of bricks and every time you hit a brick with the ball the brick disappears and uh you know the goal is to get all the bricks and it gets very fast and it gets very difficult and you're um having to control the ball at various angles and there's a, a video uh, where it goes in the, in the first trial you know it misses the ball immediately um but then after you know 50 trials it's hitting the ball regularly and then after a thousand trials it has broken the game it has figured out how to get the ball above all of the bricks and have the ball just bounce up top and eliminate all the bricks from the top um and it's scary to watch the computer figure that out relatively quickly um that i think yeah. is, is sort of uh where you start to see like how smart the machines can be I mean, I don't think there's any question of the intelligence of of AIs. Like it, on a on specific de linear tasks, they can you know endless endless ability to to recognize and calculate things. And that where it gets kind of more more questionable is like I feel like in order to if something we would understand as sentience to develop, it would have to be just so many of those linear tasks, just billions of them all intersecting in, you know, basically how neurons function. It's not, right. it's not a series of tubes, you know, it's like a, a mesh. It's just so dense that you can't see the moving parts anymore. Then I think we're a ways off from that, but, but it is starting to get a little, a little creepy for sure. Yeah, yeah it definitely is. So, um, what was it challenging creating a world where the majority of the population doesn't need food like humans do agriculture and eating impact our communities and economies so much. 
which is interesting question on top of that it you know you didn't take on the challenge of like explaining how the whole robot society functions which would be probably really boring if that was what the book was about but maybe maybe not but um but so yeah I, I mean the food anyway go ahead yeah no so so the food thing is is part of the preserve because the humans are still eating um and they need to still produce food for themselves and so um you know there are there's there's agriculture and there's uh there's still markets uh and and um sort of one of the key like elements of the story is that the way that food is being shipped around the preserve and off the preserve um so i do focus on that from the human perspective um for, but uh the robots i mean the the food the robots need is still they need power they need electricity um you know the uh they sort of still plug in at night um just to to repower um so that's that's their aspect and and kira who's the robot uh jokes with the main character's daughter about uh you know getting juice and making sure that she's getting enough juice and and sort of plays with that idea of, of feeding on electricity i found it adorable uh how they charge themselves like that they just plug themselves into the wall like they're an iphone and yeah <laughs> it's just such a cute image of the robot just like all right yeah, but yeah, yeah. That's, they def, you know any any life form biological otherwise has has to contend with you know entropy and what what it is that keeps them alive and in in robots cases it's just much more convenient and efficient because they can just you know pipe it into any outlet whereas we have to shuffle materials all around which is a huge right. game <laughs> right yeah I did have somebody asking Getting hungry just talking about this. <laughs> when Baron Cove came out, though, I did have somebody ask me at a reading about what, uh, how are they generating the energy, and whether they're still like using fossil fuels or if they're, you know, everything is solar now. Um, I'd like to think that they they've transitioned completely to a, a solar, uh, you know, system. But at the same time, they have uh, even sort of less reason or significantly less reason than we do to, to care about the ecology <laughs> because they're not part of the circle of life. That's a good point. Really. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Maybe no, that's they are. a really interesting point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Would they be affected in any way by the total collapse of the ecosystem? Yeah, no. So I, I don't know that they would be. So in the answer to your earlier question, there's definitely still a lot for me to, to mine in, in this world. So that's really all that that we as humans need to worry about is just figure out some way to like have food paste come out of a, a jack in the wall that doesn't <laughs> isn't created from animals in any way or plants, <laughs> and then right. we can just let it all die and we'll be yeah. fine. <laughs> There's just still the the flooding and the the scorching sun and all that stuff we have to worry about. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Here's a question that that I hate, and I know every everybody wants to know this in in every interview and I, I i don't judge anyone but i i personally always try to avoid this one just because it's it's i find it weirdly difficult to answer but i think i'm i'm in the minority of that but what authors inspired you when you were younger so the question is how much younger are we talking about um the, <laughs> <laughs> right i mean i just reread um, run, uh, um <laughs> yeah clifford the big red dog <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean i just read the i just reread the chronicles of Prydain, which are the lloyd alexander sort of high fantasy um you know farmer boy becomes king kind of story um i recommended it to my daughter and and she read it and loved it and i i promised her i was going to reread it too which i wanted to i hadn't read it since i was her age um so you know stuff like that um stephen king uh was a big influence for me. Um, I started reading Stephen King in elementary school, which is maybe earlier than you're supposed to read Stephen King. Um, and I 
and I still read Stephen King, um, and his book on writing um, came out when I was in college and was definitely still forming uh, who I was as a writer, and it was very influential um, on me. But, um, you know, the I, I like hard-boiled fiction a lot, um, and it's they're not uh, esoteric. You know, Dashiell Hammett and, and Raymond Chandler and Jim Thompson, Thompson um, you know, those, those are people I continue to read and reread and look at, um, you know, so, so I would say that those were big influences on me. And then, um, as people who've read the 20 year death know, I mean, those authors, but then, um, Fitz, Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald is, is somebody else I read and reread. Um, he, he's a big yeah. influence. I could see that in, in Baron Cove. Yeah, and I think it comes through a little in some of those um, conversations that you are saying happen in the preserve um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, there's definitely a, I mean, I guess it's more like a 70s drug culture in the preserve than a roaring 20s uh, sort of, but there's a bootlegging roaring 20s kind of aspect yeah. to the preserve as well. So, you know, Fitzgerald, uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, detailed that world as well. You know, one of the things that I, that I love about the, the, these kind of twists and like these sort of subtly added genre elements to, to what is essentially a, a literary story, or in this case, you know, more of a, a, a crime kind of story is that like, they they highlight those those more sensitive kind of moments like the philosophical moments stand out in stark relief when it's when they when they're in the context of you know places you don't expect it like you're in the middle of a a firefight with robot detectives and then the next scene you have these sort of quiet contemplative moments where the 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 contrast to me amplifies it more than if it were just you know the whole book were people sitting around in coffee shops discussing philosophy, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have the same impact as it does when it's sort of like giving these little moments to shine amidst like a very different feel. So, yeah, so just an another note. <laughs> yeah. And well, a moment I aspire to, and I, you know, when I, when I do have those moments, um, Graham Greene's The Quiet American um, has, you know, is, it's got, political intrigue and, and it, you know, it's set in Vietnam um, when it's uh, still like the French in Vietnam. And um, the American, quiet American has sort of, is the beginning of the American presence. And, um, and like I said, there's, there's political intrigue. There's, there's a little bit of a um, spy novel kind of feeling to it, but in the middle of the book, uh, the, main character two main characters um are caught in a firefight and they have they sort of are hunkered down and they have this sort of existential uh conversation graham green was a you know a catholic writer who um struggled often with his faith and and that's something that happens a lot in his books and sort of the way that that moment is what you're describing, where it's suddenly they're having this very serious conversation. That's, I often think of that moment in that book um, and sort of hope to achieve something like that. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned Stephen King. I've got to ask what, I, I didn't know that, that you were, a fan of his, let alone um, an influencee uh, of his, but so that must have been pretty mind blowing to uh, get a blurb from him for the twenty year death. I'm, I've I've been curious since since yeah. I found out about you how that came about. So so first off, it was I mean it, like and that was the first blurb that came in for the twenty year death. That was the first one, um, and <laughs> so it was. I mean, it was just mind blowing. And I, I wrote him a thank you letter, um, you know, telling him that I had fantasized always that I would maybe just 
send him my book when it finally came, you know, when I finally became a published author that I'd send him my book with a note saying, you know, you were a big influence. And then I could just, I could just dream that he had read it, you know, when probably it would just be you know, <laughs> to his, his right. staff. Um, and to have, to know that he had read my first book and that he enjoyed it um, was sort of more than I could hope for. In terms of how it came about, um, the Hard Case Crime, who, who published my first uh, book, um, they've they've published Stephen King. Um, the they, Stephen King's done two books with them previously, and then he has one coming out with them this um, spring, which I have on pre-order already. Um, so, so my editor, you know, and the publisher of, of Hard Case has a relationship with him. Uh, so I was just fortunate that that he had that personal connection, and that um, you know Stephen King gets, I'm sure, thousands of requests uh, every year, and and I'm just fortunate that he was willing to, you know, that something something interested him about the 20 year death that he chose to read it. Isaac has frozen. I can come back on then. This is Constance. Let me give me get my sure. back up. Yeah. So we are getting close towards the end of the event. So I guess if there was a time to freeze, now was probably the most opportune. <laughs> freeze is never ideal. But there is there is one more question. I don't know if it's a spoiler or not, but would you like me to ask it? And if it's a spoiler, then we don't have to answer it. But there is one more if you'd like me to ask. Uh, yeah, no, go ahead, and and um, I don't think it's a huge spoiler since sort of the it's the premise of I, I, I peeked and saw it looked at what it was, so okay. I uh, you know it is the pre the underlying premise, so I think it's okay to talk about. Okay, awesome. So um, the last question then that we'll end on is what inspired you to give the humans these reservations and remove them from the AI rule ruled world? What made the robots decide this? Right, so the political climate, the political world um, in the preserve is complicated. And we learn that there are lots of factions among the AI. Um, and there are also, of course, lots of factions among the humans. And there are humans who feel very strongly about continuing humanity and um, when they were sort of spread out because, uh, you know, the plagues sort of wiped them out uh, indiscriminately, um, it was hard to try to re rebirth humanity. And so I think that there were a lot of humans who were lobbying for this. And then mm -hmm. there are, um, and then there are a lot of robots that are in the book that are referred, you know, both the humans and the robots are referred to pro-orgo are the, the people who are, you know, for human rights, sort of. Um, and so I think, you know, so there were factions among the robots that felt like they, in some ways, have a responsibility to humans. You know, humans created them. And, um, you know, in, in before times, they served humanity. Um, and I think that there, uh, you get the sense that there are robots who still feel like that is, uh, you know, their purpose or their underlying directive. Um, and so the preserve uh, is their way of allowing humans to try to rebuild and, and sort of to still take care of them in some way. It very much reminds me or has very much a feel to me of how our, and you might have done this on purpose, but how like our current we're like the apex predators of the world and we do that for endangered animals now and it's it's always nice when you get glimpses of a world where humanity is not the apex predator that it is so used to being yeah so. there's a there's a, a line early in the book so I, again i don't think it's a spoiler that um says that so so the um the main character's wife is uh, involved in two sort of important uh, re repopulating 
act, you know, activities. And one of them is she's a teacher and she runs a school for children. Um, and but the other is that she volunteers at a um, at a clinic that's designed to uh, facilitate the rebirth of, of people. Um, Reading program. <laughs> yeah, it's a pre and they and they say that basically they're using uh, techniques that they used to use to save animals, and um, many of which now outnumber humans. That's about right. I bet the humans are like, finally, we out <laughs> humanity. Why did the robots want to mess it up for us? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Well, we are at the hour mark for the event. So unfortunately, yes. it is that time in which we will have to say goodbye. I'm trying to see if Isaac, I'm checking to see if Isaac can join us or if his internet has, has officially gone kaputs on him. But um, while we wait to see if he can pop back on, um, the last thing I always like to kind of end an event on with is what are you currently working on? Because I know this book just came out, right. but I know that writers, while they're celebrating a new release, still normally have many things going on behind the scenes as well. So. Yeah. I am, as I sort of alluded to earlier, I'm working on a new novel um, that is a, a crime novel. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's, I don't like to go too much into a book that I'm um, writing before it's sort of ready, um, but it is sort of in the vein of uh, Patricia Highsmith or um, Jim Thompson, that, that sort of uh, mid-century crime world again. Nice. Very nice. So something to look forward to as well for everyone. Well, I want to thank you so very much for joining us, Ariel. And Isaac, if you are out there in the interwebs and can hear us and or <laughs> not hear us, we are sending you thank you vibes and thank you for yes. being such a great host and conversation partner. And I, I want to thank Mysterious Galaxy for having me. Yeah. And one of the um, sort of side effects of the crazy world we're living in is that I'm getting to make a appearance at a California bookstore that I would probably not have been able to get to in person in normal times. Well, I'm super excited that we got to have this event with you. So we're also very grateful because your book is like, it's like the epitome of like all the mix of like genres that we love at our store. So it's just... It was such a good setup and I'm very happy that we were able to virtually make it work since we're not in an AI run world, but right now we're very much in a tech run world because we're all <laughs> <laughs> So we will go ahead and say good night to everyone. Thank you so very, very much for joining us. If you wish to purchase the preserve, it is amazingly awesome. The link to purchase it is going to be right there down below for you, and you will get a signed book plate with it, which is pretty awesome sauce since you can't go to bookstores for the most part and see authors right now. So it's a really cool opportunity. And once again, thank you so very much, um, Ariel, for joining us. And also to Isaac out there in the ether, thank you. <laughs> and all yes, of you thank you. Ladies, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Take care.